The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. G'day, Clayton here from Ensemble. Thanks for joining me for this podcast. It's a pleasure to be able to do this from time to time. Hopefully you enjoy. If you're not already on Ensemble, please go to Ensemble.com or find us in the App Store. This podcast is proudly brought to you by 360 Health, MetLife's award-winning end-to-end health program designed to help your clients defend against serious health conditions so they can live healthier for longer. MetLife's 360 Health provides quick, easy and discreet access to over 50,000 leading local and global specialists, including general practitioners, doctors, psychologists, specialists and mental health clinicians. Talk to a MetLife sales manager today to find out more about how you and your clients can access expert medical support and guidance from the comfort of your own home. G'day, how's it going? What do you know, Striker Light? Clayton here at Ensemble Podcast today, chatting with Chris all about financial planner marketing. Mate, thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me, Clay. Look, yeah, um, I, this goes back to, uh, as most things do, it goes back to the Grammarly, quite frankly. <laughs> um, oh, a little little tip from uh, from a marketer to a financial planning yes yeah, oh, absolutely content absolutely yeah, yeah. and um and w- i mean when i when i think about grammarly uh, cuz cuz we're a growing business and so things like the written style guide was really important to me yeah um and uh, you know cuz we had some people whose uh, first language wasn't english yep and i would always see these little things that bothered me yep um but now that i've got this ability <laughs> to just permanently uh remove the word for example that yep <laughs> <laughs> that is so removed 90 percent of the time and um and yeah man like we we were sort of chatting uh about financial plan and marketing and grammarly was sort of one of the things that we discussed yep. but there's there's this huge i would call it gap now that that exists between financial planners who are doing marketing really well yep. and have just super embraced what um, what professional services can be, yep. I would call yep. it, in the modern quote-unquote uh, world. But then you've got a whole lot of financial planners who are sort of uh, are still very much of the opinion that they can just outsource everything yep. still yep. Uh, and not play that, I guess, important role. Yeah. Um, and so someone like you who works with a lot of financial planners, you see what works, you've seen what hasn't worked. Yeah. And I thought, you know, what better uh, opportunity than just to sit down and chat with you. So yep. my man, when it comes to financial planners, let's start high level. What do you see work and what do you see that doesn't work? Yeah. Well, I'm going to probably launch into a bit of brand and marketing. Uh, I'm going to probably marketing geek out a little bit here, but- what I, what I see from financial planners are th- those that actually understand the marketing process and understand the concept of a brand, okay? So those that do it really well understand that they are a brand, yes. okay? And they are a brand, a personal brand, mind you, yep. but a brand that needs to be positioned in a certain marketplace. So they understand that by developing content, they are creating a brand for themselves and positioning themselves, I suppose, ahead of other financial planners because they're yep. out there producing content, putting their viewpoints forward on financial planning um, and really trying to drive a message home about them having a, an expertise and maybe in a certain area of financial planning or it might be general. But at the end of the day, they've understood that they need to be on the front foot yeah. with creating content, um, creating a brand for themselves and being really, you know, the, Putting themselves out there, if you like, and, yep. and putting content into the marketplace. Whereas some some financial planners don't. They kind of expect the leads to just come. Uh, look, I've improved my website. I expect those leads to come. They don't see the need to put content out there and really position themselves within the marketplace, which is what really marketing is and what branding is. You know, they need to really understand that in order to then generate. Because what 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 many don't see and what don't understand, and it's what I call the silent salesperson. Okay, so 
say in uh, the financial planning game, there's off there's a lot of referral business that gets put forward. So you're referred by someone who's happy with your work, but what does that customer do? Mm. They invariably search for you and try and check you out. So what does your silent salesperson look like? Yeah, you know, so they're out there searching. They're right. I've just been referred this financial planner. Don't know anything about him. What do they do? They go onto Google. They go onto everything else. Search, use, you know, and what does your silent salesperson look like? If it's crickets out there and if there's nothing out there, um, if your social footprint isn't very good, if your LinkedIn footprint's not very good, if your profile's not complete, if you you don't have a profile page on your website that actually highlights your expertise, yeah, what are they going to find out there about you? And what are they going to understand about you no. um, as a brand? Um, so that's one thing that those that do it well have a fairly good social footprint, online footprint that people can actually see, good reviews, you know, a complete profile on their website, a good photo, a nice photo, not a stock photo of the guy who looks like uh, the former prime minister, can't remember his name, but it's just, there's this photo that keeps getting used in financial planning. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. The classic. Yeah, the classic. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Malcolm Turnbull, looks like Malcolm Turnbull, that was right. the one I'll search you for. <laughs> Every time I see him, I go, as the as the perfect <laughs> As the guy, but yeah, that's that's how I see the people doing it well are a brand, and they are uh, really position themselves very well. Place, yeah. Um, would you say marketing is more important now than it was in the past? I think it's more accessible. Yeah, and I think I probably that's the better question. I think because it's so accessible, in that it's free to have a LinkedIn profile. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um. I think the emphasis or, or the expectation that a professional service uh, person or people or company has a footprint, as you call mm. it, the expectation now is pretty high com- yep. compared to even a decade ago when all of these things existed. Yeah. But even then, I wouldn't say that it was a massive expectation that you had it. It was a yeah. kind of a nice data. But that's dictated by the customer. Yes. The customer has driven that. So where do, yeah. what does the customer behavior model look like? So that's that's the thing we need, you really need to think about in marketing. You know, it's a, cust- it's a customer decision-making process that occurs. So the customer doesn't, you know, we don't load, we, we no longer look at yellow pages for a financial planner. We no longer do these things. We look online, we do all these things. So at the end of the day, the customer has driven the need to build that that silent salesperson and, and really understanding that how how important information search is as part of the decision making process because yes. ultimately the customer is looking there to make a decision they've driven they they dictate how, they dictate how you are found and you need to be there yeah available and majority of the time people are spending time on uh, social media yeah spending time on on google so if you're not mm. if you don't have a google review for yes. example yeah. it's going to not that you're going to lose the lead. It's not. It just it, helps. It's, it's a credibility factor yeah. that yeah. It, it, it probably means that the emphasis is going to be more on the sale within mm. the within the meeting room. Yeah. Then, uh, then the way that I think about marketing is just simply pre-sales, and that the better your the way that you're articulating is, the better and the more prevalent your silent salesperson is, the less sales. Yes. that's on your yes. on your responsibility set. Absolutely. Once once the or once the potential client comes to your office, yeah, there's 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 a number of things that a customer is looking for in terms of looking for you know, in, in this obviously mark of the financial planner. So you need to tick the boxes. So testimonials, reviews, um, experience in the industry, uh, whether or not you're a, you know you have an actual photo that isn't a photo of you on the beach. In your LinkedIn profile, you look. Do you look professional? I'm trusting you with potentially my financial future. Yeah. Are you someone who I can trust? Who looks to me like um, they know what they're doing? Do they have the experience? Do they have the qualifications? Do they have the right accreditations? Are they, you know, they all, all the different things that are required to to give them trust and confidence yeah. to and and more often than not, they're checking that out before they're even making contact with you. Someone may have actually referred you, but they're yet to actually make any contact. They've yet to pick up the phone, but they will know all this stuff about you before they walk in the door to have that first that first meeting, that discovery Absolutely. meeting. And yeah. if I think about the way that I do referrals to financial planners, because I obviously know quite a number of them, 
um, the questions I asked are, you know, like, uh, what are you looking for in a financial planner? Where are you in Australia? Does it matter if you're re- if they're remote or not? Yada yada yada. I'll, I'll, I'll do a, a, a somewhat of a mini fact find. Yeah. Um, but then I'll, I'll, I'll offer them a few options. I'll say, well, by the sounds of it, someone like this yeah. might be applicable, and I'll give them a handful of options. So I'm giving someone a referral, but I'm not emailing no. that person no. and the potential advisor to introduce them i'm saying do your own due diligence on these on these practices yeah and at the end of the day it's up to so even a referral goes through the process and I, and i do that sort of i would call it i've never been told to do something like that but i just feel that's the normal way that i buy something yeah as i like to go through a journey of researching things online yeah, yeah. And so all I'm doing is really just whittling down the options for them to get started. And but it but still the journey yeah, yeah, yeah. between the person looking for the advice and the the, the, the practices that are putting information. Yeah. So out. what what you've actually articulated is is the the, the basically the customer decision making process. Yeah. Okay, it's 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 marketing one hundred and one. You learn it first year of uh, at marketing school. Okay, it's you know first step. Need recognition, problem recognition. There's a problem I need solving. Yep. Okay, there's a problem. I need some help with my finances. I need a financial planner. Then there's the information search phase. So what do we do then? We go and search. So it might be that someone rings you and says, Clayton, do you know anyone who can help me do X, Y, Z in financial planning? What you've demonstrated there is the evaluation of alternatives, which is the next phase, the decision-making process. And that's what we all do. And every decision that we make, whether it's buying a buy, what are we buying for lunch? What are we are we buying a new car? Are we trying to find a new financial planner? A financial planner get get some life insurance. Do all these things. I need well income protection. I need income protection. There's your problem. Information search. Who do I need? To, who do who should I use to yeah. get my income protection insurance? Google. Ask friends. Do go through that information search process. Then you whittle it down to the alternatives. <laughs> which is what you just demonstrated there. Uh, then you make a decision based on the whole, all of the information that you've gathered, yeah. and then you make a decision to, yeah. to either meet with that person or to to buy the insurance or to um, agree to go ahead with a financial plan, whatever it is. But that's a classic model of decision making that is just consumer behaviour. That's how it, it works, it, isn't it? It's just it feels so much. It feels so normal. And I, I, I mean, before let's call it the internet. Um, so we're, we're going to go back a fair while, but yeah. you know, yellow pages made sense because you, you, I guess it was a simplified version, but you identified a need, you opened up to the part, yep, you looked at the options. Yep. That were, who had the biggest ad yeah. normally? <laughs> you pointed to the number. Who's paid twenty grand for an ad in the yellow pages? <laughs> Probably they must be doing well. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, we got the phone and call, yeah, and so yeah. that I, I guess that was just a hyper. Um, accelerated version of what we have now, which mm. could take months or years. Yeah. And really, the marketing uh, process or, or the ability to to market yourself is just being findable, searchable, being available yeah. when people are going through that process. And the other thing is to be able to articulate how you can help solve their problems. So that's where the content comes in. So how are you solving their problems? What are the case studies that you have yeah. where you've helped someone who may have, you might have secured income protection insurance for them Yeah, and you know, something's happened to them overseas and then they've, they've actually been very lucky that they had that involvement with your business yes. and they... You know, they have um, income protection that is paying them until the age of 65 and they they don't have a, a financial worry. Yeah. You know, it's those it's those things. So it's that how have you articulated. This is where, yeah, when we talk about content, um, what content are you writing? You, are you talking about how you're solving people people's problems and what are the major problems that are out there and, and the emotions around financial finances? Finances, financial planning and finance is an incredibly emotional thing you know that's uh, i think it's um statistically i wrote a i wrote a big piece of content for a client once that said it's um the the, the number one um cause of divorce i suppose yeah. in the country talking yeah. about money money yeah. problems talking about money wow. people and people don't know how to talk about money that's right you know how do i approach this subject with my partner yeah. you know so there's a lot of emotion around money yeah. and and financial planning and the decision to go ahead with a financial plan um, and you need to be aware of that I mean, and talk talk to that when you're looking at producing content. Not just it's not just a you know 
the decision to go with someone can be can be very much based on emotion. We know that from a fact in marketing. You know, eighty percent of a buying decision is emotion. Yeah, you know? think about real estate. Yeah, yeah, the exactly. Enemy of it, exactly. So using emotion and and creating content that does hook into those emotional needs and problems yeah. is is very very powerful in terms of driving and and and, and driving your personal brand as a financial planner. And driving inquiry and making people feel comfortable that you can help solve their problems because you've done it before. Yeah. Well, one of, and it's always, I always like to think about uh, one of Ensemble's uh, co-founders and, and he sits on the board still uh, is um, Ben Nash and the bearded advisor. And he, he's done quite a, quite well for himself. And I always like to sort of stay uh, on top of what he's doing because yeah. he tries everything. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, uh, yeah. And, he, and he's done a lot of, he's done a lot in this. And one of the things that he's told me that works really well is exactly what you're saying in terms of a case study, mm. it, it, as simple as these people came in, this is what yep. they look like, this is what they wanted, this yep. is what we achieved, this was the outcome. Yep. And it's really simple. It is. It, it, that, and, and he just speaks to a camera yep. on his phone, right? Yeah. It takes him, you know, maybe a couple of minutes to sit yeah. and write out those set details. Yeah. But he he said that just that yeah. by itself, with nothing else, because people can relate to that. They see their own problems within that case study. They yeah. say that's where I'm at. Yeah. And he may be talking about you know their family income of X Y Z. They yeah. currently might have you know kids in private school or you know struggling to do X Y Z, wanting to buy a home. Yeah, people can relate to those those financial um, discussion points. Yeah, you know, they can say, oh yeah, that's me. Yeah, you know, that's what you want. You want your marketing to say, yeah, that's me. Yes. And this guy looks like he can help me because he's yeah. done that for someone else. Well, so the thing with Ben is, and uh, look, I, I mean, I, I know maybe some of the listeners wouldn't believe me when I when I say this, but one of the reasons why I like podcasting and not videos is because I don't like sticking my mug out there. Um, I'm like Ben. So genuinely, when you work with financial planners, um, how much of your job is trying to get them comfortable <laughs> with putting themselves out there. Yeah, there is there is that reticence to, and I think that's a natural hum, human behaviour. I do have some clients that are very confident <laughs> as well, so more than happy to put themselves out there, more than happy to be interviewed on camera and are very capable at it. But yeah, there are those that sit there and go, oh, I don't, don't know if I really want to do that. I don't know if I feel comfortable you know, creating video or... And I have some that, you know, when they started, I've got a client who creates video on a quarterly basis as for a market update. And, and early on, he was probably a little bit clunky, but he's very, very polished now. Very, And it's experience. It's like anything. You, you do it. The more times you do it, the better you're going to be at it. Yeah. You know, it's, it's just naturally like that. It's public speaking. When you, you know, we all first started public speaking. We didn't like it. We thought we were terrible. And then you do it that many times, <laughs> yeah. you're naturally going to get better at it. So... I think it's just one of those things. It's it is hard, but they've also got to understand what they do. What you do have is um, financial planners seeing other plan, uh, what other financial planners are doing, and it comes comes to realization. Okay, well, I kind of need to be doing this. Yeah, you know, I just can't sit here and sit on my laurels and yeah, um, expect everything to come to me. I've got to be on the front foot. I've got to be you know pushing my personal brand out there. Yeah, um, creating a profile for myself. It's like the thing, the people who I think do it really well are real estate agents. Like, tell me you don't know any real estate agents in your area. You know, God, they they put their mobile number on billboards. I mean, I can't imagine how many phone calls real estate agents get (laughs) with a photo of themselves. But, you know, in their local area, they're they're visual, they're present. People know. You know, you want to sell our own. If if you don't know, like, I I, I know all the real estate agents in my area. It's just the fact that they're... They're involved in the community. They're they're out there. They have their faces everywhere. Yeah. That sort of thing. That sort of philosophy. So, um, it's one industry that does it well. Um, but yeah, there's when when people aren't used to it, there is a reticence to yeah put yourself out there. And but at the end of the day, if you put yourself out there and and speak with confidence and know what you're talking about, there's no financial planner who's not qualified. You know, you well, yeah, you're not. It's it's, it's a pretty rigorous. <laughs> Um, profession in terms of um, professional development, ongoing personal development. Yeah. You know what you're doing. You should have confidence in in what you're doing and the service you're offering. Yes, and and put your profile out there. So let's say let's go through. I, I'd be keen to sort of go through what a classic client looks like for you. So what's a typical engagement? So 
I, and I guess what I'm really asking is in your mind, what are top priorities that you see as common faults in, in financial yeah. planning? Look, it's, there's, there's a few things. So my clients are typically don't have internal marketing. So that's why yep. they use me. Yep. Okay, they don't have, um, and they're, what, I w- what I would call their marketing infrastructure is quite poor. So from website to um, brand to messaging, on, on their website, it's generally very poor. It's very, it's very much internal looking and not customer. Custom doesn't none of it speaks to their customer. So, um, I'll, I'll generally have a client that have a really clunky website that's never never updated. Um, they might have a LinkedIn company page that never has a post, doesn't have a post on it for two years. Ooh. Um, their own personal profiles aren't getting updated. They're not active. They're not doing much. But and some of the time, it's just because they're busy yeah. and. They're finding it hard to like. There's, there's grand intentions to do all these things, client newsletters, trying to activate the marketing. But the biggest pain point, you know, if for, for, for I look at the decision making process in my line of work, is actually activation. So mm. that's the biggest challenge: is activation, actually getting the marketing happening yep. regularly and getting in, and getting it out there. Yeah. Okay. So posting on LinkedIn and doing all those things. Um, that's that's the biggest challenge they have. But generally, prior to activating that, there is underlying infrastructure that needs fixing. So it could be, um, could be like a client that had a really nice brand, but was wasn't implemented according to brand guidelines. So to, to a degree, fonts were all over the shop. You know, the things were very, you know, and you, the pet peeves of marketing guys, financial planners kind of don't really care. Yeah. But you know, it's like your OCD kicks in as a marketer when you sit there and say. Hey. Eight different fonts on a website, and oh, and you know space, spacing all over the place, and and people go, well, why is that important? Well, your customer's looking at it and thinks you're all over the shop, yeah. and your stuff is all over the shop. Yeah, um, you know, and you know, documents. You know, so they might be their financial services guide might be a word document written with um, Times New Roman, and, and you know, document that's really putting. You know that that is a document that has to go to really every person that interacts with your business, and it's in word like doesn't speak professionalism. So there's yeah. so e- early on in, in typically an engagement with a client is getting that stuff fixed. Yeah. Okay. So that might be they might have, they may have eight or ten documents that need completely to be rebranded. Yeah. Um. Some some potentially rewritten, but yep. not necessarily always. They're, yep. they're, they're legal documents that have been approved, yep. Yep. but they just look horrible and, and they, aren't they building look, trust in the marketplace. They look like something- They look amateur. Yeah. It, um, I remember once I sent uh, my wife to, you know, she was asking about tax returns and she's not originally from Australia. And so I said, oh, look, you know, you've got pretty simple needs. Just go to, I think it was an ITP or something. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And she said- walked into this building and yeah. it was she said it was literally like it was something out of the 80s it was stuck yeah, in time yeah. And, yeah. and the documentation that you're talking about it sort of belongs in a place like that yeah 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 and and it's first impressions it and yeah. and it is it's peculiar but i know for a fact she never went back there regardless yeah. of, of what the tax return was like yeah it's because i think we, we just have an innate high level of I think attention to detail that we expect on yeah. from people that are providing mm. anything, let alone a professional service. Yeah. And if we don't get those kind of basic things met, there is a hesitancy. Yeah. And it's actually what I will call because I in terms of my own experience, I've come from brand management in uh, at a high level. So in corporate from corporate world and it, you know I've those businesses, I, I, what I try and do is try and educate businesses at the smaller end on how the big boys do it. So from a major telco, you know, their brand brand management and the, the, the rigidity around the brand is really, really like you just can't, everything has to go through marketing. Yeah. Um, everything has to look according to brand guidelines. And there's a very good reason that those companies are the size they are because of the structure around that yes, and the importance of that to attracting customers. That's the thing that I don't understand. Oh, this is not important to attracting customers. I just got referred to someone the other day. And yeah, but it's that person who walked into your shop and walked straight back out because of poor branding, poor visuals, poor, yeah, the poor environment that you've created for them. There's all those things that the, that the clients you, you don't know you're missing out on. Again, the silent salesperson, you know, yeah. that's part of it as well. 
um, the environment that you create, your office environment, all the things. You know, I remember back back in my sort of those brand management days where you know the the office would be branded completely. You know, it was just like this. It was full on, and everything was. And I was actually the brand manager, so my, my role was to actually educate everyone. So I'd, I'd have to approve all this stuff. Wow. And it's fine because now, now I've got that full-on trained um, mentality of everything has to be on brand. And, yes. you know, you can't let that go out. This, this is not this is not where we are. You can't, that can't go into the marketplace. Yeah. Um, so, you know, trying to, trying to get that understanding and the, the challenge that you have when you have the smaller business is getting underlying staff to know that they shouldn't be putting anything out in the marketplace that's not on brand and because people just don't know they've never been exposed to it. they've worked in big corporate they will have been exposed to it yeah. but if they're just working in a small financial planning firm yeah. somewhere out in the country and they let but something I out understand as well i yeah, yeah. a lot of people don't get it to 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 get yeah. way around it yeah uh, I, I when i first launched my company i was with hill ross and hill ross had all these brand guidelines and they'd say well it has to look like this and i, I literally said okay yeah cool and then go design something that couldn't be further yeah, away yeah, because yeah. I just asked someone online to do it for me and then someone from Hill Ross would say hey um, well this is super yeah, different yeah, to what and I'm like what do you mean and they're like yeah. well look at the font and I was like oh you you mean you want me to use the same font they're like yeah, yeah, yeah. oh god at the bare minimum yeah, and yeah, and so yeah. it it would take it's if, you, if it's not something you're paying attention to it does take a little bit to get your head around but I think the moment that you do get your head around it all of a sudden, you you notice the internal, let's call it the feeling that, uh, let's say I have when I when when my engagement with a particular company is uniform. Yep. I even if I can't express why that is yeah, or how yeah, that it's, is, it's unconscious. There is yeah. a there's a sense of calm and Comfort. things of yeah. knowing what you know that oh they and, and part of me feels like I, I was watching. Uh, Ricky Gervais talked about something I think uh, just the other day when he said, you know, he gives ridiculous requests when he performs occasionally. I think I saw that. Uh, it, 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 what's called a rider. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and he said, but the, but you want to know? It's more the can these people pay attention? Because if they can pay attention to the the ultra small, yeah, you just innately feel like they can take. That they're paying attention to the yeah. ultra big thing, yeah. and and that's sort of just a natural extrapolation of logic. Yeah. And so as you go through, and the feeling and the experience is uniform. Mm. It's not that it has to be the most beautiful, but just no. that it's uniform. Yeah. All of a sudden, I feel just more confident that people know what's going on. The barriers to the decision to the purchase decision are slowly removed. Yeah. You know, it's part of the process of as soon as you know, I, I liken it to like if you take it out of financial planning in the corporate world, if you look at going to the supermarket and your favorite brand of mayonnaise changes its packaging, yeah, it throws you for an absolute loop. Yeah. You go, I don't know, is it the same one? I don't know, it looks like the same one, but I don't know. Like, yeah. and there's a law of what they call the law of just noticeable difference. So, 10% and it's a, it's a law related to pricing as well. So what will people notice? So if you change the packaging on something um, over 10%, so there's a greater than 10% change, yes. then that does impact the decision to purchase. So packaging is obviously big, big and important in yeah. FMCG and going to the supermarket. That's a, it's a big part of the marketing. Um, same with pricing. If you put your prices up um, lower than 10%, people go, oh, that's fine. Put it up higher than 10%, then they start to notice and then they start to... So there's, there's these laws that you've... And that that's... One of those things, you know, in that environment, you go, yeah, you're actually right. It does impact my decision to buy something when something's one thing one day and then looks completely different the next. Yeah. It's the same product. It's the same packaging. It's the same cheese in the yeah. packaging. Yeah. But you've changed that much that now I've lost a bit of confidence in that I'm actually buying the thing that I'm used to. Yeah. So I will look at something else. Yeah. I'll look at another type of cheese that... I might then become brand loyal to and, and so forth. So um, it's just, you know, that's that's trying to trying to bring an example together where it's, oh, yeah, because I, I know the common thing with brands, financial plans, they go, oh, it's not important. Yeah. yeah. But it really is important. Yeah, it really is. So Yeah, I, I agree. And if I think back to when I first started 
goodness, my financial planning company, this would have been the 2013, so yep. a decade ago. I I really knew nothing about marketing. And I remember I went to some sort of marketing event for financial planners and someone was at the front talking about how important social media mm. uh, marketing was. And I was 30 years old at the time, so I was probably the youngest principal advisor in the room. But I was sitting up the back with a couple of the old boys and they looked at me and they said, are you convinced? And I went, no. I wasn't convinced that I needed to do anything in that space yeah. because you, you, you're you achieving a certain level of success without it. Mm. But I, 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 would, I just think that these, this day and age, it's so hard yeah. to not do it that if I could go back to myself 10 years ago, I'd say, um, you might want to rethink that no strategy. Yeah. yeah. I think from a social media point of view, it just helps that people know what you do as well. And I don't mean that from a necessarily a pitching business point of view. Yeah. You know, you have a network of people that know you. If you're a financial planner and they don't know you're a financial planner, yeah. then <laughs> that's a bit ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, they should know uh, what you do. Yeah. <laughs> You know what I mean? Like, it's, uh, it's, it's, the, it's the easiest referral level yet, but they, they know you, they like you, they trust you, they just don't know what you do. <laughs> you know? Spend a bit of, you know, just put on your socials that you've just attended the the uh, the um the ensemble yeah. day, you That's know, right. just put that on there. Oh, I didn't know he's a financial planner. Actually, you know what, I might have a chat to him and um, give, him, give him a ring. I didn't didn't realize he was, that's, that's what he did. Like, yeah. ABC incredibly surprised how many opportunities get missed. Because people don't know what you do. You, go, you can go to a, a barbecue. Yeah. I actually just invested X, Y money, X, <laughs> X, X amount of money with someone. I didn't, if I had have known that you did that, yeah, um, that could have been your business. You know, I just, I just insured my whole family with, with yeah. someone. Yeah. You should have told me you did this. Yeah. It is, well, th- that's a, it's a weird sort of classic. Um, we did some research when we were, you know, just constantly doing research around financial planners and, um, the, the classic financial planner is a confident, but introverted person, yeah. which I thought was a super interesting yeah, yeah. combination of, um, of characteristics. And so, yeah, I, it, it does sound like a, a financial planner who, who you do get along well with, yeah, you know yeah. what they're like, but you don't know what they do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it would be the same if you knew, you know, a real estate agent, you know, if one of your mates is a real estate agent, don't you? <laughs> you know. Exactly what they do, right. you know. Um, and when it when it comes to so even for let's say our company ensemble itself, which in a way I guess you could call social media, but um, you know, we're, What's we're community engagement. Yeah, 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 it's much more of a professional networking platform. Yeah. Even even with a company like us, like I was going through with someone in the team earlier today around what what we should be posting about. Yeah, and so it's. It's a little bit different with us because we're we're constantly re- releasing education, you know, mm-hmm. whether it's podcasts or you know documentaries and everywhere in between. But I, I've sort of started saying, hey, we need to start saying things about our company, not just promoting content. Like yeah. promoting content, education is great; it's what we do. But we need to actually start talking about who we are as a company, yeah. what we do, because. I would say even though we've got a third of the market, it's still two thirds yeah. that aren't on our yeah. platform, right? Yeah. So so there's there's a massive gap for us to fill and and we were kind of you know, I'd go back and forth with a couple of people on the team and they'd say, What about this? And I was like, nah, not quite. So I actually had to sit down and 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 sort of go through a couple of like Twitter and LinkedIn's that I that I follow. Mm. And say, okay, well, these companies are doing these type of things well. And then yeah. I was able to kind of break it down into different categories. And then from there, you can kind of mind map out some solutions. But my my point is, for a company that owns a social media platform, yeah. even we struggle yeah. with how on earth we should talk about ourselves and write about ourselves and... I think uh, to the to the average advisor out there who's mm. super you know busy and yep. and and looking to um, you know add value to their clients. When it comes to this social media and the marketing, there's yep. often a, a huge 
I would say reluctance to mm-hmm. even because of the of the thought process that they need to go through to get it up and running. So I I yeah. I, I got some questions for you. Um what have you seen that and you don't have to mention any names. Yeah. What are some of the funniest like uh either lack of attention to detail or just like super missing the mark that oh, you've seen in your career? It doesn't even have to be five your planners. God, you could have could have pre warned me on that one. <laughs> no, I don't really have. have you, or, or even when, when you used to um, when you used to do the big branding sort of stuff. Yeah. Did you ever see something come out that was just super far off course? Constantly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's a constant. It was, it's always a constant battle with doc, you know, documents going out. That's just someone's just mopped horrific. up in the corner. Yeah, yeah. Literally just mopped up. Well, like I've had even more recently. You know, we don't. I don't use Canva as any. Uh, Canva's a great tool for, yeah. and it's actually a tool that you'd probably recommend to financial plans. I don't use it. I use Adobe Creative Suite because I mean, we design stuff. Um, but it's just you know, oh, we've I put together this on Canva. Yeah. You know, like a, 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 you know, it might be a employer of a client that um, has decided to put a document together that's to go out in the marketplace and completely off brand. <laughs> you know, created in Canva looks. You know, like a template. Oh, and you know, has has little caricatures in it and all sorts of stuff. And I'm like, oh my god, clip like art. Just, yeah, clip Good art, day. clip art. Good old clip art. Good old Malcolm Turnbull probably turned up in there as well. <laughs> <laughs> Our old mate from uh, Shutterstock and I stock photo. So I know my angel client. Yeah, yeah. It, but when I actually, I'm going to go back to the point he talked about what to post about um, about your business. Yeah. So there's, you know, you would have potentially done work on mission mission vision values and all those different things so articulating to people what you what your vision is for ensemble even yeah you know, you've got a group of people that are yeah. part of part of the journey you know what is your vision for the business it's you know, there's the one sort of stuff you know yeah. I mean, what's what's our mission what are, what are we here to do what's our a lot of these things are your brand so your brand story where have you come from? Where are you going to? Yeah. Why have you gone from X Y advisor to ensemble? Yeah. Why? What was that decision? What is what what are you hoping to to gain for that? All those different things and take people on the journey. Your your brand, take take people with you on your brand journey. Yeah. And and have them because they're part of a community. They're they're part of a of a collective group of people that are obviously um like minded. Yeah. Um, wanting to see the industry grow. Yeah. Um, and want to be a part of ensemble. Yeah. And they need to buy into that as well. But if I don't know what it is, it's a good point. Yeah, it's a really good point. Yeah. Um, yeah. And from a financial planning point of view, I, I can imagine that would be identical for them as well. Like, yeah, absolutely. Like, Look, that's why, that's something that I get into when we do. Planning. Yeah, when we do when we engage with with a client, you know, we go through a branding workshop. Um, yeah. You know, even if they've may have gone through something like that before, you know, what are your brand foundations? Yeah. You know, what What's your brand personality? What's your vision for the brand? What, what, why do you exist as a business? Yeah. You know, what's your ultimate goal? What's, what are the, you know, and, and articulating all of that really gives clarity and allows you to create that, that story and that messaging to talk about your business and take it into that emotive space as opposed to rational, oh, we're just a financial advisory firm. No, yeah. you're not. We're, we're helping people um, live the life that they've always wanted. Yeah. We're, you know, we're helping people to, you know, fulfill their dreams. Yeah. Running their own home to wanting to travel all the time. What is it? What is, um, what does your future look like? What do you want for your future? Is it? It may not be that you you don't might necessarily want five million bucks in the bank. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you might you might be just happy living in here and just being able to not rely on government pension and have enough in super in order to live a live a life post retirement. So not everyone's financial goals are the same, and being able to share how you can help people through your vision, your mission, your marketing messaging that is emotive as opposed to we can provide financial advice. Then it, you're going to hook in. And, and what's interesting about that is if I look at a company like um, the wealth designers originally over in WA, um, Troy McMillan, um, but have expanded around Australia, uh, a lot of the early, I guess, inspiration that, ensemble or back then XY had in terms of what it meant to produce good financial planning. A lot of it actually came out of, and I've had the chance to tell Troy this, his sort of messaging back in the day, it was some of the only stuff that was out there that was very lifestyle driven, yeah. it was very yeah. sort of approachable. And he he 
you know, is a bit of an OG when it comes to um, putting forward financial planning uh, as as a as a as an aspiration that people should have. Yeah. Now, interesting. Even he just went through a massive rebrand. Yeah. Massive rebrand. Yep. I sort of just thought of that when you said, even if they, even if someone had done this a while ago. Yeah. Because although he was, um, and and, and myself included, were, was very impressed with what he had done previously. Yeah. Nate, the nature of business is such that he's sort of grown in a particular way, mm. him as an individual, his staff that work with him now and, and are probably co-owners um, and the clients that the company has attracted over time. It's now gone from this concept of this is what we think or this is the line in the sand that we're drawing in terms of this is the company that we are to no, now we've actualized yeah. that original um, sort of thesis and we're extremely confident and accurate now. And so things changed a lot. You know, when he first started, the, the pictures were black and white. Yep. Right. Yep. And there was a sort of a class or classy yep. sort of element to it. That's now been sort of replaced with a lot of greenery. Yep. So when now there's pictures of his office and it's, there's lots of, lots of plants around, lots of light, lots yep. of open, yep. um, and it's not so much the the suit and tie, which it was previously. It's it's you know um, loafers, yeah, yeah, kind yeah, of thing. And yeah. and what really struck me about that is, look, he probably did it better than anyone. Yeah, and his company, yeah, uh, approached it differently after a decade. Yeah, yeah. Well, your businesses evolve. Yeah, you know. And end of the day, you you, it's not always going to be. The brand you created ten years ago isn't your business isn't going to be the same business ten years from now. It's going to be a different business. You know, all of our businesses are different. Yeah, and it's going to require potentially a could potentially be a name change, can be a yeah. um, identity change, an identity refresh. You know, if you've still got a website that you built ten years ago, then you are cool. Which I'm I'm actually reviewing one at the moment, which is about ten years old, and <laughs> we. <laughs> Well, the world, has, world has, has, and oh, the world has the world has moved on from <laughs> some of the design features of, um, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, but that's that's all around, you know, user experience. What users expect, what customers expect, yeah. they expect to see when they when they hop on a website, what they're seeing from competition. If they're seeing an outdated ten year old website, then the next person they're evaluating, yeah, has strong calls to action, has emotive messaging, talk to them, talk to their pain, talk to their problems, talk yeah. to their needs. Um, gives them a capability. Oh, it's even to a point of being easy to get in touch with. Yeah. <laughs> I've been met of websites I see with a contact form hidden in the back. Yeah, <laughs> so I'd be up up front, ask yeah. for the sale, ask for the contact. Yes, um, those things. So, yeah. And um, what are you finding uh, is working well with uh, calls to action? So, oh, re- just a contact form or oh, requesting callbacks and so forth. Yeah, yeah, requesting callbacks. So putting it on. You like people don't like be calling the phone. Sure, yeah, <laughs> that's in marketing folklore. People don't like picking up the phone. Some do, yeah. most don't. Yeah. So making that easy for them to articulate what their inquiry is. So drop downs in contact forms. What's your inquiry about? Right. To, to make the comment. Yep. Um. And when when's a good time to get in contact with you? Yeah. You know, um. That's probably the best. Okay, cool. So you, so it's basically because I know a few years ago there was a bit of a trend around downloading a doc, like a yeah, yeah, yeah gated yeah. content. Yeah. yeah, gated content's fine, but that's not a sales qualified lead. That's a marketing qualified lead. So gotcha. Um, a sales qualified lead is someone who wants to speak to you now. So your end goal is a sales qualified lead. Yeah, that's a really good point. I've never yeah. actually heard that terminology. Yeah, yeah. So a marketing qualified lead is really someone who's downloading content. So if you if you, if you take it to the, um, the extreme, you, you, you've actually got – there are actually marketing tools out there that can help you track what people are doing on, on, on your website. Yeah. So, um, from a point of view of tracking their IP address and knowing who they are, what yeah. they're doing, yep. um, what they've looked at, what they've downloaded, what content they've looked at. If they've looked at an ebook, downloaded an ebook. Yeah. Actually, you get – if someone's provided your email, you know if they're doing that. But um, what you really want – so when you have a website and you have content on there, articles, blog posts, podcasts – Yeah. Um, if you use certain tools that are available in marketing, you can track what people are doing. And they go from 
someone who's uh, potentially a what you what we do call that marketing qualified lead. Marketing qualified leads are people who aren't ready to talk yet. Interesting. Okay, so that's your silent salesperson, the marketing yeah. qualified lead. So I've downloaded a fact sheet on financial advice or whatever it is. Yeah. <laughs> your, uh, your financial services guide or whatever it is, yeah. then looked at a blog post or watched watched a video on your website, gone through all of all of this, um, and then potentially the ideal scenario is that they then obviously request a callback. So you'll have calls to action on every page on your website because they've seen enough about you. Yeah. Um, and then they'll request a callback and then That's it. That's it. But it's good to know, I guess, what what sort of call to action works because I remember I am even still going back in the day, you know, sign up for my weekly newsletter and things yeah, like that. Yeah, it's all you've really got to you've got to have a pretty smashed newsletter for yeah. someone yeah. for someone to want to sign up on it in your footer on your website. <laughs> I'll be frank with you. <laughs> um, <laughs> this unless this thing's famous and been on the front of Forbes, you're gonna probably struggle. Yeah. Um yeah. it's it needs a hook. It needs a, a you know, download our tips, uh, download our guide to buying a new home, download our, you know, yeah. and whatever it is, you know, you need to have a, you need to give something to receive. You, 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 someone giving your, their email address to you is a transaction. It's a value yeah. exchange. And yeah. what value are you providing? If you're providing a monthly newsletter, yeah. um, it's probably not. That's great not of great value. No, it's not, not of great value. <laughs> if that is um, a education series on how to do something and find if it's financial services or whatever yeah. it is, if there's yeah. an education series, hey, Dan, get get our 10 uh, weekly emails um, educating you on something. Yes. That type of thing will then encourage people because there's some value in it. There's, yeah. You, and if, it, if you've done it right, you've hit a pain point as well. So you've hit a, you found a problem and you've, you've created an education series that helps people to understand and, uh, and you can articulate how you can help them solve the problem. Yes, and then at the end of that series of emails that you send them, which can all be automated. Yes, um, there's a call to action that says, um, that, you know, that that the, what you've tried to do there is take them from that marketing qualified lead through to a sales qualified lead because they've become educated on how you can help solve their problem. Yes, and then they have a call to action on that last email that says, you know, do you want do you want to talk? Let's chat. Let's talk. Let's that's a that's a tidy call to action as well. Yeah, we'll do the work. You just let us know. I like that yeah, as, as yeah, a yeah. action. Yeah, yeah, and, le- and it's in. It's in. You, I'll tell you when I'm available. Yeah, because they don't want to ring and have. The worst thing is, no, you can never get anyone on the phone. Totally these days. Yeah, you can never. You know, I, I was at lunch the other day with a client, um, and they said, whenever someone calls, I think there's something wrong. Yeah, and I was like, that's yeah, that's the epitome of yeah. People hard to get on the phone. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So you just need to make that easy. You just need to remove that barrier. Yeah, and say, hey, when when when's a good time to call? People are busy. People have got families. Okay. There, you know, call me this time. Yes, no problem. And then they're ready for the call. Yeah, they'll pick up the phone and on on your on your way. Speaking of calling and speaking of people getting in contact, how do people find you? <laughs> ah, oh, marketinghq.com.au. Google Chris Dale Marketing HQ. <laughs> uh, actually, you should be able to find that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we'll it's really, really confusing what I actually do, isn't it? My, my business name. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Really, really sort of hard to articulate yeah. what we actually do. Yeah. Marketing HQ. It's sort of, it, yeah, it's not exactly lost in translation. Yeah, yeah. And, and our tagline being put your marketing wheels in motion. So it's about activation, getting a, getting making the rubber hit the road and so forth. So yes. Um yeah, I'm on I'm on LinkedIn. I'm you know, I'm not necessarily my I don't actually drive a lot of um leads through um social media, like in terms of Facebook right. and, yeah. and so forth. Like yeah. you'll you'll find me on Twitter, but I, it's not really an active platform right. for me. Um but yeah I'm on I'm on LinkedIn. I'm managing LinkedIn accounts of many clients. So <laughs> <laughs> go for uh, those things. Yeah. <laughs> Hosting on people's behalf. But um so yeah, yeah, that's where that's me, marketinghq.com.au. So Well mate, thank you for coming in. I, I uh as someone who shares an office with you, uh, and I was saying the other day, it, it doesn't surprise me at all that the marketing guy already owns the address. <laughs> so whenever I whenever <laughs> yeah, yeah, whenever I invite someone with the yeah, 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 like, you know, marketing the address in, oh marketing HQ, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. That was the first thing I did. Because <laughs> uh, I knew you blokes wouldn't be clever enough to <laughs> Figure out you Google. Uh, have you Google well, definitely not. You Google business uh, platform. Still, I could probably claim all of your businesses on Google. 
<laughs> and scrub you all. <laughs> Just remove all competition. Well, mate, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, really appreciate it. Thanks, Clay.